several times has just attacked Alex Hammond for being overweight. And and that, you know, apart from it, that being a case of the pot calling the kettle black, I, I find it extraordinary that that is the standard of of political debate at the in the Scottish Parliament's showpiece event. You know, we've had a couple of MSPs on this programme before. Um, we had Patrick Harvey and we had Carolyn Leckie, who used to be MSP. And they said that like a lot of the work that goes on in the Parliament when the cameras is off in some of the committees is actually really good, dedicated, and there's cross-party support. But then when the cameras go on, it just becomes absolutely appalling, all of it. You know, they, they all start to play up. The thing is, if you watch Prime Minister's questions, Hollywood suddenly starts to look quite good, because they are all just baying and howling at each other and it's it's even less constructive than FMQs is. And I am I do hear that, that, I mean, the Scottish Parliament does seem to be set up in most respects in a better and more constructive way than the UK Parliament is. But that only works if it's, if it's conducted in good faith. And I don't believe that since the SNP won in 2007, it has been conducted in good faith by the opposition. They've just as far as I've been able to see, as far as the public's been able to see, all they've been concerned with is obstructing the SNP and scoring points against the SNP. Yeah, in some ways it seems that that's more important to them than the No campaign. It's just get salmon, which I find extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know who they think they're, they're winning over. I mean, you'd have thought that after 2007 when they spent four years doing that and then got an absolute kicking off the Scottish electorate as a result, you'd think they might have worked it out then that people don't want to see this kind of playground stuff. But it doesn't seem that they have. Or if they have, they haven't got a plan B. That's, that's all they know how to do. Do you think it comes from a kind of sense of entitlement that Scottish Labour have that, you know, they've been in charge for so long that it's, it's their rightful place? Enormously so, yeah. I mean, the Tories, for all I despise pretty much everything they stand for, seem to have handled Holyrood opposition in a much more constructive manner, perhaps because they've never expected to be anything but the opposition in Holyrood. Whereas Labour, it's absolutely plain that Scottish Labour regard Scotland as their birthright and they are, as far as I can tell still in the depths of a five year long huff Yeah, and do you think that uh, there's been some good articles recently, I think it was Owen Jones, the Independent, it was a few months back and he wrote an article saying that, you know, they haven't, he wrote an article saying that they haven't adapted to the post-devolution settlement at all Um, do you think that comes into it? Certainly, I mean, you can't ignore the talent issue with with Scottish Labour, because anyone in Scotland in Labour who is any good wants to be in Westminster, and Labour wants them to be in Westminster, which they think is the far more important Parliament. And so, what you get left with in Scottish Labour is this ever decreasing pool of of talent. I, don't, I once likened it to a. I said, I said the talent pool's got the plug missing. It's only <laughs> it's only ever going to get worse for Scottish Labour. Because the people they had who were any good were sort of a legacy of when they put some decent people in to get Holyrood started, as it were. And all they've got left now is these over-promoted councillors and hopeless seat fillers that never expected to get a seat and got shoved in from the list because the party did so much worse than they expected to in all the constituency votes in 2011. And I don't see any way out of that for Labour, except, ironically, independence. Yeah, that's the strange thing. It could be the best thing that happened to Scottish Labour. Um, but like, given all this that we've been talking about, um, do you think it's strange that we're still down at maybe uh, the most recent poll, I think, was 33% for independence? Uh, do you think it's strange that we're still only at a third, uh, given what we've been on about so far today? I don't think particularly it is, no. I mean, I've said for, for many, many years that the core positions of the yes and no votes are 35% and 45% respectively with a five degree margin of error either way. So the yes vote fluctuates between about 30 and 40 the vast majority of the time, the no vote between 40 and 50. Now, I don't think most people are paying very much attention yet because the referendum is still such a long way away. Most folk are much more bothered about 
things in their normal life. And it doesn't mean they don't care at all about the constitutional debate. It's just that I don't think they'll really start caring about it until we're in 2014, at which point they'll start to think, all right, well, now this is kind of the priority issue that I need to be that I need to be considering. So I'm not that bothered that we're not making progress or much progress at the moment. But I do think since the start of this year, the tide has palpably started to turn for some of the reasons that we talked about earlier on with n- people who are natural no voters just being turned off by their own campaign. Yeah, and this is actually quite a strange thing because it brings us back to FMQs. If you're thinking like, you know, a lot of the public, it's not the most important concern at the moment. Most important concern is the crisis, unemployment, underemployment. But at the same time, whilst accusing the SNP of being obsessed about the independence referendum, every single week it's Lamont and Davidson who who are banging on about the referendum in the most negative terms. And there, they're, they're actually stopping the debate in a lot of ways. Although she has talked about, you know, some of the things in the health service occasionally, but generally, you know, first minister's questions must essentially be reactive. The first minister cannot control the thing; he has to react to what's said. And it's the opposition parties that are generally constantly on the referendum, not not the first minister. Oh, uh, this is absolutely true. I mean, one of the things that I've been wanting to do on the site for a while, but it's just it's too big a job to find the time for at the moment, is to go through every FMQs since the 2011 election and find out on how many occasions Joanne Lamont's come out banging on about independence, despite claiming that nobody cares about it. It is it is a very odd phenomenon. And again, I think it all just it leads back to the fact that all they want to do is try and score some kind of a point against the SNP rather than do anything about any of the the issues they claim to care about. I mean, you have to you only have to look at this stuff that's that's come up about the bedroom tax this week, when uh, Dundee Council had a vote on actually passing or no, it would not it wouldn't be legislation, but actually having a policy whereby they wouldn't evict people, and Labour voted against it in favour of uh, a motion that just had a go at the Scottish government, and that's that's just Labour in a nutshell. They don't want to actually do anything if instead they can just bash the Nats. Yeah, and at the same time accusing the Nats of not sticking up for the people. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, that, that is the irony of it. They say, we demand that the Scottish government use the powers it already has. And then when Dundee Council tries to use the powers it already has, Labour votes against it in favour of just attacking the, the SNP. Yeah, I find it quite uh, depressing all at the moment. So, uh, given all this situation, what do you think at the moment are the prospects? I mean, uh, you're saying you can see the tide starting to turn. I'm, I'm still quite optimistic because I think there's a few things to be wheeled out nearer the time. And something that people don't mention much is the effect that the Commonwealth Games may or may not have. But do you think prospects are quite good at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I get more optimistic as time goes on. I think it can absolutely go either way but the longer we go through the debate the more i sense the bigger i sense our chances are i I don't see something like the commonwealth games having any impact i certainly don't think the anniversary of bannockburn is going to have any impact ironically i think what might have more impact is if england are doing well at the 2014 world cup and they're all over the telly and people are sick of it but that aside um i think the more we actually get to hear the arguments then the stronger our our side will will become because they can't avoid the arguments forever and i i honestly believe that every single one of the facts is on our side i i'd be forced to agree with that also another thing that people think when when we get nearer the time labor and conservative are going to be fighting out in england and this might you know it it, it becomes harder for them to sustain a united front and better together if they're knocking lumps out of each other for the Westminster election. Do you think that's going to provide a big bonus for um, the yes vote? I think that's certainly likely to be a factor because both of them care far more about power at Westminster than at Holyrood. And we're only going to be six months away from the the Westminster election by the time the referendum comes round. So yeah, they can't afford to be as cosy as they are now. Certainly Labour can't afford that. And yeah, that's that's not going to do us any harm. But all of this stuff is sort of tactical stuff. I say, as uh, what I think is that we are going to have to, they are going to have to address the arguments as we get close to the time because they can't just 
keep pumping out these increasingly shrill, hysterical, and laughable scare stories for another 18 months. You can't, you can't keep ramping it up from um, where they already are for another year and a half. What for you has been the funniest one so far? I, I don't know if you heard on our Christmas special for, on the For All That podcast, I made a kind of funny quiz of the five silliest scare stories of the year. Um, I don't know, in, in the whole thing so far, what's been the, the daftest or the strangest one for you? For me, it's the one about hotels. The, the tourist industry would suffer because people weren't sure where they were going anymore. Yeah, I, I hadn't actually seen the, the hotels. I think my favourite was the, um, the Edinburgh pandas being confiscated. Confiscated uh, by who? The panda police? What? what was <laughs> it was a story in the Mirror uh, quite a while back. Said, um, uh, I, I've had to, I'll read it to you. Last night it emerged that the two Chinese pandas currently at Edinburgh Zoo could be taken off Scotland if they choose to become independent, which I assume means Scotland, not the pandas. It says officially they were gifts to the UK government, and it quotes a Westminster official as saying, no one has fully understood the ramifications for the pandas of any bid for Scottish independence. This is wonderful. This is, But this is a London Tory conspiracy, because they want to have more Tories than pandas again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think they're a bit embarrassed about that old joke. I think they think, aha, we can, we can kill that joke by simply getting rid of the pandas. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's got to be the ma- most major concern about Scottish independence, the, the, the status of the two pandas in the zoo. It's certainly the the thing that keeps me awake at night. <laughs> yeah, well, just to come back to yourself for a minute, are you really a reverend? Because I heard a rumour. <laughs> I really am, but uh, I don't talk about my religion. It has nothing to do with politics. Ah, okay, so we're not going there. Uh, in, in in religious terms as well as in uh, journalistic terms, I'm, I'm what you might call freelance. Ah, okay, yeah, I'm in the Spaghetti Monster Church. My my good lady's a teapotist. <laughs> <laughs> that that must cause some difficult some schisms around the the breakfast table, I imagine. Yeah, you should hear the theological debates around our house. Uh, it, it gets quite heated sometimes. But anyway, in in the future, in an independent Scotland, how would you like to see the society change? Let's be a bit more prescriptive instead of reactive. How would you like to see things change? Well, this is a difficult one. I mean, a theme that I've banged on about at great length. On, on Wings Over Scotland, is that the referendum isn't about deciding what sort of a country we'll be. It's about deciding what sort of a country we can be. It's about deciding to decide for ourselves rather than having people in southeast England whose priorities are, are different to ours choosing our government for us. So I'm, I, I'm always a bit reluctant to start saying what an independent Scotland should look like because that's not what we're going to be deciding next year. I mean, my own politics are are pretty left-wing, but as I say, I just, I'm not sure it's particularly helpful when people start insisting that an independent Scotland will have to be this and have to be that. I think we need to focus on the actual issue that's at stake in the referendum, which is who chooses the government of Scotland. One last little question, just something I saw on Wings this week. You said um, there was a good article about why newspapers are dying. Do you think that the fact that newspaper circulation is going down, 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 and obviously sites like yourself and Bella Caledonia and others continue to grow, um, do you think this is what the Yes campaign needs to be working on? Instead of complaining to the media for fair coverage, they should be working on their own internet media strategies. Within, with people doing it independently, like yourselves, or like we do with these podcasts, or also the Yes campaign should have a strategy and be working on this better than they are now. I think that, I mean, that's a very difficult one. I, I don't think I don't think we can win the referendum just online. I, I think there are too many people who just don't go seeking out politics, information, news, commentary, and debate online. I think people take what's on their breakfast table in the morning. So I think we have to keep hammering away with the idea that if we shame the mainstream press enough, they will just have to take a more balanced, a fairer approach. I I mean, I think you reach the young people fairly well online, but the, the biggest problem that we have demographically is that old people, the sort of people who still remember when Labour was a socialist party, are the ones who are most opposed to independence. So we have to 
find some way of reaching that section of the population. I think we I think we do okay online with the young people, but we need to somehow 